12 years ago, my daughter died of a treatable illness. My daughter Anna had an eating disorder, anorexia. Nobody should go through what our daughter and our family went through. And nobody should die because they can't get coverage that should be covered by their insurance plan. Anna had insurance. And we were stunned when she was repeatedly denied the level of care she needed that would have saved her life. I can tell you exactly where I was when mental health parity passed. Because to me, it meant that finally, after so long, one of the huge barriers to people getting treatment would be eliminated. And I was so certain that people like Anna, who had insurance, would no longer have to jump through hoops and sue and fight their insurance companies. companies are still literally getting away with murder by making it almost impossible for people to get the coverage for mental health and addictive disorders. My name is William Moyers. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs and Community Relations at the Hazelden Foundation. I am also in long-term recovery from addiction to alcohol and other drugs because I had access to treatment more than once. And when I finally got clean and sober in 1994, it was my insurance coverage along with the support from my employer and my family and my community. All of those resources made it possible for me to get help. Here I am. Am. Today I am a taxpayer, I'm a homeowner in St. Paul, I am a consumer of many products made and sold right here in the Twin Cities and Minnesota, I am intimately involved as a father raising three busy teenagers, please pray for me, <laughs> I'm employed and I am a voter, all because I am in recovery. And tonight in this room, I am not alone. Raise your hand, please. I invite you to raise your hand if you or somebody that you care about is in recovery from mental illness or addiction or both. Raise your hands. Very impressive. Nobody's in denial in this room. <laughs> I want to thank tonight's hosts and tonight's sponsors, the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill Minnesota, the Emily Program Foundation, the Barbara Schneider Foundation, Haven Chemical Health Systems, the University of Minnesota Health Systems Fairview, the Parity Implementation Coalition in Washington, D.C. Hazelin is also a host and a sponsor tonight, and I want to give a special thanks to my colleagues, Dean Peterson, the director of Hazelin Center for Public Advocacy, and Mark Mishik, the president and CEO of Hazelin. Our other host, and our host among hosts, right here, is Minnesota Recovery Connection, led by Executive Director Nell Hurley and the staff and the volunteers of MRC, and many of the MRC board members are also in the room this evening, thanks to MRC and all of your supporters. And one more shout out to Carol McDade. Where is Carol? There she is in the front row. Carol's here from Capital Decisions in Washington, D.C., and it is her tireless efforts over 20 years in the legislative trenches of government relations, yes, that's lobbying, yeah. <laughs> her work on behalf of addicts and alcoholics, people with mental illnesses, and their families who need help. Well, the results of your efforts, Carol, you among many, but you as a leader, your efforts here tonight are why we have come so far and why we still have so far to go. The implementation and enforcement of parity is vital, but even more so in this issue is the context 
What brings us here tonight we must put into the context of the Supreme Court's historic decision on health care and what may or may not happen next year in the aftermath of the November elections. I am honored to be here tonight and be in recovery because I get to live a life beyond my wildest dreams. I could have never imagined being able to celebrate every day the way I'm able to today, free from the compulsion and addiction that uh, kept me captive for so many years of my life and kept me from realizing my true calling and potential. And uh, I am so honored here tonight to be with all of you, uh, to be with uh, most especially my good friend, uh, Jim Ramstead, who helped me over the years uh, continue the fight. And he, even as I was fighting for my own sobriety and struggling, um, I was working with Jim to fight for our common struggle, uh, the struggle that unites all of us here tonight, and that is how do we make sure we treat these illnesses um, the same as we would treat any other physical illness. And that was the cause not only of my political life, but now as a private citizen, it's the cause of my private life. And I'm pleased that I'm able to look out and see so many of my fellows, not only in recovery, but people who are citizens too. And just to reiterate what Coach <coughs> said, we're all voters. And uh, what we're here to talk about tonight is how do we take the next steps to take a law that was passed in 2008 and finally realize its potential through its implementation so that we finally get it together and implement it. And that's what we're here tonight to talk about. And it's ultimately going to be up to you because just like the civil rights law was passed, ultimately it took us enacting it through a series of future laws that enshrined what fairness meant in housing, in employment, in all aspects of life. We need the same in this civil rights fight. This civil rights fight. So as you can see, I'm in recovery not only from uh, my addiction, but from being in public office. <laughs> and I should sit down right now because my time is up. But I never get this chance, you know, where people actually listen to me. Uh, uh, I really seriously want to uh, also thank Carol and the organizers for making tonight possible, but most importantly, all of you. If you spread the word, we'll make tonight a really effective meeting because it'll be beginning of how we ultimately implement the mental health parity, which we'll be talking about all night long. And I want to say uh, to my good friend, Dave Wellstone, um, his father, um, like my father, worked together on the cause of social justice. And uh, we're both very fortunate, not only because of who our fathers were, uh, but because in the process we also got to know each other. So we're also recovering sons of senators. <laughs> but anyway, we're all in recovery from everything. Anyway, thank you very much. I woke up uh, on July 31st, 1981 in a, in a jail cell in Sioux Falls, South Dakota under arrest for resisting arrest, disorderly conduct, and failure to vacate. And I'm alive and sober today because of the access that I had to treatment in 1981 for my alcoholism. But despite the legislation that Paul Wellstone originally wrote and then uh, Patrick and I worked on them together for 12 years. Legislation which was passed by Congress, as Patrick mentioned, and signed into law by President Bush in 2008, October of 2008, despite the fact it was an act that hundreds of thousands of Americans today in health plans are being denied their rights under the federal parity law. Unfortunately and tragically, tragically, many insurance companies have put plans in place that circumvent the parity law and interim regulations, thereby restricting patients' access to life-saving care. For example, many, many treatment health plans are excluding residential treatment for substance abuse. Other plans, as hard, hard as it is to believe, continue to require patients to fail first at outpatient before admitting them to inpatient. I mean, that makes a lot of sense not. 
<laughs> and that's regardless of other medical necessity criteria being met. That's outrageous. And these other shameful, and they are shameful, they're blatant abuses by health plans are illegal and they must be stopped. According to Faces and Voices of Recovery and their spokesperson, Pat Taylor, our dear friend, a number of health insurance plans have actually created new plans, new plans, brand new plans that specifically exclude benefits which should be offered under the new regulations, such as methadone maintenance treatment. They specifically exclude a number of, of uh, treatments that are authorized and uh, in, in terms of the statute. Well, in the absence of regulatory guidance, many insurance companies have released plans, and I mean many, the majority, that fall far short of what Congress intended in the statute. And I thank Faces and Voices of Recovery. How many of you are members of Faces and Voices of Recovery? Thank you. Thank you, all of you, for uh, uh, calling to the attention of the American people and the regulators the um, abuses that are ongoing. Because the discriminatory treatment needs to be addressed immediately. Federal regulators must enforce the new regulations. And it's absolutely unconscionable that a final rule has not been issued. I mean, as I said earlier, as Patrick said, this legislation became law in 2008, signed by the president. Nearly four years, we still don't have a final rule. In my 28 years as a legislator, no bill that I was a co-sponsor or sponsor of took such time to get its final rule. So I respectfully, and I mean that respectfully, say to Secretary Sebelius, Solis, and Geithner, please issue a final rule on parity without further delay. There really is no excuse for the failure to enforce parity. Access to treatment for people suffering the ravages of mental illness, chemical addiction, is a life or death issue for millions of Americans. Let me close by saying this, the bottom line, it's about time we treat diseases of the brain the same as diseases of the body. No more discrimination against people with mental illness or addiction. No more higher deductibles. No more higher co-payments. No more limited treatment stays. No more decisions made by the insurance companies instead of the doctors and the treatment professionals where the decisions properly lie. It's about time we have a final rule that ends this discrimination against people with diseases of the brain. Thank you. Jim Ramstead and Patrick Kennedy are proof that addiction is a bipartisan illness. <laughs> and so is recovery. And so is recovery. You spoke my line. <laughs> For far too long, and there continues to be, even today, the stigma of mental illness and substance abuse. Individuals are left feeling voiceless. They feel powerless. And without access to health care treatment options, they feel, how can I go forward? The truth is, as Bill pointed out, we have all been affected in some way by mental illness or addiction. My name's Betty, and my father was an alcoholic who never went for treatment. I know personally people who have struggled with children as well as adults who self-medicate themselves because of mental illness and don't know where to turn. There's a Washington Post editorial. It's called Waiting for Mental Health Parity. I'm tired of waiting, and I know there are children all over this country that are tired of waiting for a parent to be able to come home, put their arms around them, and say, together, we're going to get better. Many of you know Representative Tim Mahoney, and when Tim first got elected to the State House of Representatives, I was already there, he came into my office and said, I've been told I can talk to you about sober high schools. Well, this is a headline that makes me very upset. Most sober high schools are very successful, so why are they facing the acts? My children had friends who, um, had either parents who were 
dealing with alcohol problems, and one young man himself, and trying to find a way forward for him to change his life around. A sober high school was one of the places where he knew he could go and get the support. And let me tell you folks, it's not easy, especially if you have parents at home that are in denial about what's going on in their life. But the one that has captured our, our attentions um, quite a bit, especially in the women's community, is a disorder that has been going on for very, very long. And a disorder which is just starting to get attention now, but is something that I know and I personally know I have no idea of how to interdict, how to be supportive, and what to do. And this is from Men Post. Eating disorder patients fight double the battle, their disorder and insurance firms. Folks, I'm here to tell you, I work for you. We share this journey together. And it won't be over until a family member or a patient goes in for help and knows that they can receive it immediately when they're ready to receive it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm Darlin Benjamin, the District Director for Congressman Ellison, and he has a statement that I will begin to read for you here now. Americans are in the midst of an historic shift in the treatment for and perceptions of mental illness and addictions. Anyone coping with a mental illness should feel comfortable seeking treatment options. I hope all who need help with their individual challenges will feel secure enough to share their personal situation with others and receive comforting and supportive assistance in return. I also hope we as a nation continue to improve access to available treatments. Many of the improvements in these areas can be attributed to the past work performed by others. The entire mental illness and addiction community, patients and providers, have benefited from the tireless advocacy of leaders such as Senator Paul Wellstone, Congressman Patrick Kennedy, and former Congressman Jim Ramstead. Their advocacy over the past few decades has diluted the stigma attached to mental illness and addiction. The work they began in the 1990s serves as the solid building blocks to support our efforts today. Landmark legislation to provide equal coverage of mental illness and addiction in the same manner as physical conditions is strong policy that impacts lives. We must continue to work to expand coverage of mental illness and addictive conditions by insurance companies. Some may consider coverage of a medical condition a luxury. I consider coverage a necessity. You cannot put a price on the value of a human life and coverage, and coverage for life-saving treatments should not be viewed in terms of profit and loss. Mental illness and addiction may affect anyone regardless of their income. We should not create a society where only those who can afford life-changing or life-saving treatments are able to receive appropriate treatment. The mental illness and addiction parity legislation is a major achievement, and I hope we soon see the day that everyone who needs treatment is receiving that treatment. I wish to thank the legislators who are here today who support this legislation and organizations that support parity, such as the EMILY program. I hope this hearing is a success and productive. Thank you. Keith Ellison, Member of Congress. Uh, certainly mental health and addiction is in every family and we have it in our family. And after the, um, the loss of my folks and my sister, um, you know, uh, I kind of took a, a break and was not real engaged in life for, for quite some years. Um, got re-engaged to a large degree uh, through the mental health parity fight. Um, met my wife, Leah, who works with eating disorders, and so we sort of see that on a, on a regular basis. I hear what goes on there. Um, but this fight to me is very personal because, yes, my dad, 12 years ago or 15 years ago, this was hugely important to him, but it really got me back on my feet again, uh, got me re-engaged, and I'm real excited <clears throat> I may not sound like it in my voice right now because I'm, I'm tempering myself, but I'm real excited <laughs> to get out um, and to work with you uh, and for you on this issue. And we need a final rule. We need to get that done now. And I'm going to just be quiet and let everybody else continue. And we need that rule because of what you're going to hear, because of the very testimony you're going to hear and the very things that these folks have said tonight. Thank you. 
Given the realities of Washington today and what we know is coming in November uh, with the administration, how realistic can we be that we're going to see final regulations implemented by the Obama administration? Well, the fact that the Supreme Court ruled to uphold the Affordable uh, Care Act, or as I like to say, Obama Cares Act, um, yeah. we can now we can now really get to work because a lot of uh, distraction was caused, quite frankly, by uh, all the, the people who were, you know, trying to vote for repeal, and we still just had another vote for repeal. But Jim's right, Patrick's right. I'm pushing for it. We need to get the rule moving. Hello to all my friends taking part in today's Parity Field hearings. I think you know I would much rather be there with you in person, but there's just a few things going on in Washington right now, and so I'm honored to join you via video. I want to thank the Minnesota Recovery Connection and the Parity Implementation Coalition for bringing together such a talented and dedicated group of policy leaders and health parity advocates. I know my good friends Jim Ramstead and Patrick Kennedy are there, and I want to recognize them for the courage they have shown, both in sharing their own stories and in their long-standing commitment to these issues. I love that they're best friends. It, I wish we saw more of it in Washington. I want to also recognize David Wellstone, who continues to carry the torch lit by his dad, Paul Wellstone, a passionate and tenacious leader in the fight for mental health parity. And I want to say a special thank you to Kitty Weston for inviting me to speak to you today. As one of Minnesota's most outspoken advocates for eating disorder prevention, Kitty is on the front lines of this battle. She took the unspeakable heartache of losing her daughter, Anna, and turned it into something good, into an effort that has improved and saved the lives of countless people throughout our state. It was a great honor for me to stand next to Kitty at an event in Washington two years ago to discuss the FREED Act legislation, which I've introduced along with Senators Harkin and Franken to advance the treatment and prevention of eating disorders. One of the most important things the FREED Act would do is to change the way we look at eating disorders. There are still a lot of misconceptions out there about what these conditions represent, and it's important for people to recognize them for what they truly are, complex medical and psychiatric illnesses. This is the driving belief behind so much of our work to promote mental health parity, the idea that mental illnesses are just as real and devastating as physical illnesses, and they need to be treated as such. We've all seen the numbers. Nearly one in five American adults suffer from some form of mental illness. For far too long, these Americans were shut out of the healthcare system, denied coverage for the medications, treatments, and therapies they need to stay healthy. That's why we worked so hard to pass the Paul Wellstone and Pete Domenici Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act in 2008, which requires insurance companies to provide equal coverage of both mental and physical health issues. In other words, the person suffering from depression gets the same quality affordable care they'd get if they were battling diabetes. Unfortunately, more than two years later, this law has not yet been fully implemented. Many people continue to struggle with limited insurance coverage for mental health issues, and it's clear we still have a way to go in ensuring health parity laws are being implemented and enforced. As the Weston family knows all too well, eating disorders are not always included under the umbrella of mental illness, and it's also clear we need to be doing a better job of ensuring our service members and returning veterans are getting the mental health treatment they need. In recent years, we've provided record funding increases to strengthen military health care and improve services through the Veterans Health Administration, including for mental health needs. But the fact is we're looking at unprecedented mental health challenges for our men and women in uniform. As many as half of the returning veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan who seek care through the VA have been diagnosed with potential symptoms of drug abuse, post-traumatic stress disorder, or other mental health disorders. That's why there is such a need for increased counseling service, veteran-to-veteran -veteran support groups, in and outpatient treatment, and a host of other services to ensure our veterans can not only recover, but make a successful transition back into civilian life. These are people who put their lives on the line for our country. 
Many of their illnesses were incurred in the line of duty, and the least we can do is to provide them with the care that they need to get better. As I said before, we've made incredible progress in removing the stigma of mental illness and ensuring people who need treatment can get it. That's thanks to all of you. But we still have more to do, and I know we can get it done together. Everyone deserves a chance to be healthy. That's why you're there today, and I want to thank you again for what you've done to ensure we have a healthcare system that works for everyone. Have a great day, keep up the good work, and never give up. You know that Paul would never have given up. Thank you for carrying on his and Sheila's legacy. Thank you for doing the work out of the goodness of your heart. And all those numbers I mentioned, you're not doing it because of the numbers. You're doing it because of people you know, because of people in your family, because of friends that need this help, because of people you've never even met before that are going to benefit from your work. Thank you. And you have a friend in me and many of us in Washington that want to get this done. Hi, I'm Al Franken. I'm sorry I couldn't join you today, but I want to thank you for coming together to talk about one of the most important issues in healthcare, access to care for people with mental health and substance use disorders. I know how important support services are when you or your family are struggling with mental illness or substance abuse. My friend Paul Wellstone was a true champion for Americans with mental health and substance use disorders. I feel a deep responsibility to carry out his legacy and will continue the fight to improve the lives of Minnesotans and all Americans who struggle with mental illness. We must also continue to work towards the full implementation of the bill that bears Paul's name, the Paul Wellstone and Pete Domenici Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. Because of Paul's tireless devotion, Congress passed this landmark law, and it's our responsibility to make sure it's carried out as it was written. But I can't do it alone. It is because of your work and the efforts of mental health professionals across Minnesota that more individuals in need of mental health care have access to these services than ever before. I'm proud to be your voice in Washington and I look forward to continuing our partnership to build a world where mental illness is no longer stigmatized. Thank you. One young woman who set out to recover from a very, very serious eating disorder but was stopped by roadblocks all along the way is Katie Bird. Katie Bird is an amazingly strong, courageous woman, and she agreed to come and tell her story tonight. However, she is not here because she gave birth to her second baby at 4.30 this morning. <laughs> so to tell her harrowing story is another person that I greatly admire, Elizabeth Robel. She is an attorney who has helped countless people um, battle their insurance companies and make sure they get access to treatment. So I want to thank Elizabeth for um, coming here and um, leaving her family vacation four and a half hours away to be here tonight. So thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. So here are Katie's words. Hello. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for your interest in mental health parity. I wish I could say that the battle with my insurance company was an anomaly. I wish I could say that nearly two years after the Federal Mental Health Parity Act was passed, the barriers I faced accessing mental health treatment no longer existed. Unfortunately, it saddens me to say that my story is all too common. Health insurance companies continue to discriminate against people with mental health issues by imposing burdensome tactics that the parity federal law sought to eradicate. I've struggled with an eating disorder most of my life, and in 2009, my eating disorder was life-threatening. I was restricting my food intake severely and exercising compulsively. My health was rapidly declining and so compromised 
that my cardiologist threatened to take away my driver's license. The risk of passing out while I was driving was too great. Soon I was hospitalized. After a few weeks in the hospital, my treatment team recommended that I step down in treatment and that I transition to residential eating disorder treatment. I required this level of care to fully address my illness and to save my life. Much to my dismay, my insurance company had other ideas for my recovery and denied my request. They claimed I was not sick enough according to their guidelines. The person on the other end of the phone making my treatment decisions, however, had never met me, did not know the extent of my health history, and yet determined that intensive day treatment would be sufficient. It was not. From the hospital, I was discharged into day treatment program, and meanwhile, my team continued to work on getting me into residential care. The progress I made while in the hospital was eroding and my life continued to be in danger. My anxiety and depression were increasing and I was losing weight, the weight I had worked so hard to restore. My health again was failing, but my insurance company was ignoring the important information my treatment team provided them and continued to deny my request for residential treatment. In November 2009, my insurance company sent me a letter denying my request for residential treatment despite my declining health. They claimed in their letter I was, quote, doing quite well in outpatient programming and that there was, quote, no acute risk factors present even though I had just been hospitalized. My treatment team and I appealed the decision and the insurance doctor agreed that I met the insurance criteria for residential care, but predicted that the insurance company would deny my request. By December, and, and they did, and by December 2009, the insurance company even denied coverage for outpatient treatment, and I was discharged. By January 2010, I changed to a new insurance company, and I was very hopeful that things would be different. We purchased the highest amount of coverage possible so that I could get the treatment I needed. I felt like I was finally going to get it. Now keep in mind, my husband's company isn't a small business with a minimal insurance coverage, and the insurance company isn't small, only affecting a few people. In fact, the insurance company, my insurance company at the time, insured one in six Americans. My treatment team and I were optimistic that our request for residential eating disorder treatment, the level of care I required, would be taken seriously this time. But I was extremely disappointed when it soon became apparent that it was just more the same, and I was denied coverage. And my treatment team again appealed. One appeal after another, each time with the same result. One of my favorite reasons for being denied residential eating disorder treatment was that I was not actively psychotic or hom homicidal. Now these are not reasons why someone with an eating disorder would seek residential care. <laughs> I was on an emotional roller coaster. I exhausted all appeals and eventually the severity of my situation led my treatment team and I to decide that in order to save my life, I would go into residential treatment, despite the fact that my insurance company was not gonna cover it. My health, my weight were no longer stable, and I was running out of time. Because of my cardiac problems, I would go to bed at night, terrified that my heart may stop, and I wouldn't wake up, leaving my daughter, just a toddler, to grow up without a mother. Other times, my thoughts were so convoluted by my eating disorder that I wondered if the misery of my life was worth living. I did not want to die, but at the same time living with and fighting my eating disorder and eventually my insurance company was taking a toll on my body and spirit. At this time, I also enlisted the help of an attorney, Elizabeth Robel, to fight against my insurance company. We determined that after I was done with my treatment, we would have to sue the insurance company and my, and my husband's employer to have my stay in residential treatment covered, and this decision changed everything. I went into residential treatment at the Anna Weston House without my insurance company making my treatment decisions. 
My team was in charge of my care, not my insurance company. I stayed in residential treatment for four months, and I am well on the road to recovery, as evidenced by the birth of her son today. I fight this illness every day, and some days are harder than others, but I can say that because of the care I received in residential treatment, I know full recovery is possible. Being forced to sue for mental health treatment coverage that should have been available and guaranteed through the Federal Mental Health Parity Act was incomprehensible to me and made me want to fight even harder to advocate for myself and everyone else in my situation. For me, it isn't easy to go through a lawsuit, and it wasn't. But I am not, and I am not one to rock the boat, but I would do it again in a second if I had to. We have to reach, we ended up reaching a settlement agreement in which the terms were confidential. But I can say this, I'm very pleased with the outcome, and I definitely feel like we won. Now we have run out of time for simply rocking the boat to be enough, and in order to affect real change, it is time to capsize the boat. Making certain that federal regulations for mental health parity are in place and that the law is enforced will be a major step in doing so. Thank you for your time and your support of mental health parity. I'm part of a unique council that we've created um, of young adults in recovery here from the National Youth, Co National Youth Recovery Foundation, a grassroots movement of young persons um, dedicated to advocate for change in policy and public perception for tomorrow. At the National Youth Recovery Foundation, we believe that by getting young people involved in shaping the recovery world in which they live today, we are effectively removing the stigma surrounding addiction and removing barriers for sustained recovery. A colleague and a friend of mine um, pointed out something important to me, um, that we are here today on the 20th an anniversary of the founding of SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and 11 years after the National Recovery Summit in St. Paul, that led to the founding of Faces and Voices in Recovery. In light of these anniversaries, I'd like to show that the faces and voices of young people are a key part of the recovery movement in this country. And as you take a look around the room tonight, take note of those young people that are assembled here. What we young adults have um, been in long-term recovery want to communicate tonight is a very simple and a very brief message, which I'm sure you're all excited for the brief part. Um, and that's that increasing access to quality treatment for youth coping with substance abuse and mental health disorders not only improves our quality of life, but it also improves the quality of life of our communities where we reside and society as a whole. Unfortunately though, and as many of our panelists have shared, Statistics show that the majority of youth in this country do not have access to treatment, and undoubtedly this burdens society. According to the Journal of Adolescent Health, 70% of adolescents with mental health problems, including substance abuse in the United States, do not receive the care that they need. When young adults don't receive treatment, statistics show that this burdens businesses and actually results in a loss of 1.3 billion days of work by increasing access to treatment, especially for adolescents and for young adults, we recover those economic losses. And more importantly, adolescents in long-term society and long-term recovery consistently give back to society and add to its productivity. While we maintain that it might be difficult to desi design a study that could quantify this economic gain, I am here to say with certainty that if we could, that economic gain would be quite high. I'll ask again that you take another look around this room tonight and notice those young adults in recovery. Many of them give back every day as scientists, social workers, teachers, entrepreneurs, or students, among many other things. These individuals are living representations of what happens when we invest in quality treatment for youth and young adults in, and in long-term recovery. And what I want all of our representatives to know here today and what youth recognize is that because of the Affordable Care Act that in 2014 substance abuse or mental illness can no longer be used by insurers to deny coverage to young adults as a pre-existing condition and that insurers also won't be able to use these, con use these conditions to raise our premiums 
And this is something that young adults in recovery are talking about and something that we recognize. Again, thank you for your passage of the Parity Act of 2008 and we wish you the best as you continue to fight for implementation. And thank you and remember to continue to keep our youth and young adults who have benefited from access to quality treatment in mind as you continue to represent Minnesota, the nation, and as you continue the fight for parity. And that's all, thank you. Thanks for me. My story begins on December 14, 2009, when our then 22-year-old son entered residential treatment for addiction to alcohol and other drugs. I won't go into the details of watching your child suffer the horrors of living with untreated addiction, I'm here simply to tell you how we fought for his life when he was sick. Little did we know that day that we would also have to battle with our insurance company for payments under our policy. Health Partners approved the first 30 days of his stay on January 15th. They denied the second 30 days of treatment because they said it was not medically necessary for him to receive treatment at an inpatient facility. On the advice of his counselors, we paid an additional $12,000 to continue his treatment for another 30 days. February 23rd, we wrote a letter of appeal. March 19th, it was denied. July 14th, we submitted a second appeal. It was denied that same day. We went before the Health Partners Board of Appeals on August 3rd, and our claim was approved on August 5th. The process took seven months, seven months. Mm -hmm. And it was not seven months of waiting, rather it was seven months of writing emails and appeal letters, making phone calls, asking for information about the medical necessity criteria and being told that there wasn't anything available, doing our own research, talking with experts, requesting medical files and dissecting pages and upon pages of manuals written for medical uh, professionals, preparing the actual presentation for the Health Partners Board, navigating the whole appeals process without any assistance, and then some. It was physically and emotionally exhausting. They say that a picture is worth a thousand words. I hope that the picture that you'll remember from my presentation tonight is this binder. This is the binder that contains the information that I gathered for our appeal process. It doesn't include the 160 email exchanges that were part of this process. Okay? This process was incredibly time-consuming. Without my training as a CPA and 35 years of experience interpreting tax laws, documenting client files, and representing clients before the IRS, I'm not sure I would have had the tenacity or the skills to pursue this appeals process. If I had been unable to challenge the assumptions of the experts, my son wouldn't have received the medical benefits that he was entitled to under the law. I am firmly convinced that our insurance company expected us to give up the fight because the process was just too hard, too time consuming, and too confusing, especially during a time of extreme emotional distress when we were dealing with our son's life-threatening illness. It makes you wonder what happens to families who don't have the time or the skills or the resources to endure such a process. Collecting insurance benefits under a policy shouldn't be this hard, and it shouldn't be harder for those suffering from addiction and mental health issues than it is for other policyholders with medical health issues. I have submitted a longer version of my testimony in writing to the members of Congress presented today, present today, and it details the overwhelming process we had to go through to defend our son's rights to additional treatment based on medical necessity. I hope you will take the time to become familiar with the particulars of our story because I think they highlight common barriers to treatment that exist and will continue to exist until we see full enforcement and implementation of the parity law. I would like to end my testimony with some good news about the benefits of treatment for the disease of addiction. Our son is doing great. <laughs> He's been sober almost two and a half years. He's pursuing a medical engineering degree. He's got a great network of friends in recovery, and he has restored relationships with his family. We are so incredibly grateful for each and every day of his sobriety. We are grateful that we have the financial resources, including insurance benefits, to get him the help that he so desperately needed. It's important that other families have access to benefits under their policies 
and do not have to fight so hard for life-saving treatment. Thank you. We, we had to capsize the boat to get parity passed. How do, do we, how do we capsize the boat to get the full final regulations implemented? Well, <clears throat> thanks to an organization like the Parity Implementation Coalition, and thanks to the literature that's being handed out tonight, you're going to have a detailed roadmap to how do we execute this. It's in the weeds, but so is in the testimony you just heard. The obstacles have already been identified, and there is a step-by-step -step process that we're going to take to address those obstacles by writing a rule so that we don't have these obstacles and we don't have to have people fight this fight individually alone that that these are going to be rules that raise the floor for everybody that's the standard that we're seeking in the implementation of the rule but it's it's a lot of legalese it's a lot of fine print but it's lives on the line if we write it correctly. That's what we want to do. Jim? Believe it or not, despite all the machinations about health care reform and addic access to addictions treatment and so on, Minnesota is a leader in, in being a, a, in front of the curve, if you will, around uh, health care. I know that can be hard to believe at times, but we actually are a leader. In, and, and some of the policy uh, people who are leaders in that fight are going to join us right now. Congressman Kennedy said, parity means equality. And I could not agree more. It truly is one of the big civil rights issues of our time. But I want to take a little different take on it. We've heard a lot about insurance companies and making sure that people with insurance had the same, same access, the same rules, the same fairness a better approach to appeals <laughs> um, than people with physical um, illnesses. But I want to talk about two other issues where, that I think we have to think about when we think about equality. And one is the people who don't have health insurance to begin with. And this is more of an issue today than it was a month ago in my mind because of the Supreme Court's decision. I'm delighted the Supreme Court upheld the Affordable Care Act, but they gave states the option the option about whether they were going to cover mostly single adults up to 138% of poverty level. That's uh, people with incomes up to $15,000 a year. And every state gets to make that decision now. And it, so every state gets to make the decision about whether those very poor people with a lot, we know a lot of problems that we're talking about here today, have insurance to begin with. We also have, uh, looking at the ACA, and believe me, there's a lot of great things in health reform, but I, you know a lot of those, I'm not going to list them all, but one, there's some decisions we have to make as a state to make sure we have equality, because we've been providing care to a lot of people under our Minnesota care program. And when we're looking at what counts as essential be benefits and how people are going to be treated in exchange, we need to make sure we're not going backwards here in Minnesota, because there's several people have said, we've been a leader here. And we've been a leader in making sure in our Medicaid and Minnesota care program, we have good mental health benefits, and we need to not back away from those. Another way we have to think about whether we have equality is not just equality, not just equality in the insurance world, but in the delivery system world as well. When I became commissioner a year and a half ago, the thing that surprised me the most, and believe me, if you follow the papers, there are a lot of things that surprised me, <laughs> but was that people with a serious and persistent mental illness live on average 25 years less than their counterparts, not because of something directly related to substance abuse or mental illness, but because of heart disease, because of diabetes, because of those chronic care conditions, they're not getting treated fairly. So we've got to bring changes in the delivery system world as well. We've got to integrate it. And this is one where I can just say a few things we're doing a really good job of in here in Minnesota. You know, one, health care homes. We started those before they were put in the Affordable Care Act. We now have 2,000 Minnesotans who are being served by a clinic that certifies a health care home. Someone that's going to integrate that behavioral health, hopefully, and that physical health care. We've got the Diamond Project, which is Diamond Depression Screening Collaborative in 70 clinics where we're trying to screen for depression in primary care. 
We've got what, I hate these acronyms, but they call it SBIRT, but basically it's screening for substance abuse in primary care, though it's been a big project of ours at the department, and we're really trying to spread it around, around the state so we can catch those problems early, intervene, and get them into treatment. Our new psychiatric consultation that we're starting next month with the Mayo Clinic so that any primary care physician in our state that's seeing a child with mental health needs uh, but they need to maybe to talk to a child psychiatrist because they're hard to find as we know in Minnesota can call up and within 24 hours get expert consultation and help. So we've been leading away in so many ways in here in Minnesota but even as a leader we have such a long way to go to true parity to true equality and so I just want to thank you all for being people here who will be engaged with us uh, on that trip. Thank you. Uh, it has been a year and a half since Governor Dayton appointed us to be commissioners in his uh, administration. And boy, what a, a whirlwind it has been. I say every week is a month and every day a week. It's just so much that we have to do. Uh, and what we have decided, and, and with the leadership of Governor Dayton and uh, in collaboration with the Department of Human Services, the Department of Commerce, as many people know, is the agency that is responsible for oversight of insurance, insurance companies, insurance agents, and the, basically the private insurance marketplace. We also work in collaboration with the Department of Health in overseeing some of the HMOs and all that work. When we started the administration, uh, the task of building out the insurance exchange fell to myself at the Department of Commerce in collaboration with Commissioner Jessen and Dr. Ellinger at the Department of, of Health. As everybody knows, the ACA just was uh, upheld and thankfully we now have that constitutional constitutionality determined and behind us. Governor Dayton just announced or put in a letter last week his support for the ACA and its ACA implementation, including the exchange and everything that goes with the, the ACA. So let me tell you a little bit about what that means here in Minnesota. We announced today the uh, an, an, an IT contract, which is a $41 million contract to lay the foundation and the infrastructure to build Minnesota's own insurance exchange here in Minnesota. Well, what does that mean? 1.2 million people in Minnesota will project it, are projected to purchase their insurance through the exchange. It means that 300,000 uninsured Minnesotans, not uninsured Minnesotans now, will be or have access to insur insurance and will purchase insurance through the exchange. It means more access. We have over or up to 700,000 people who will be enrolling through uh, the Medicaid and public programs. So it's not lost on us in Minnesota. We're moving ahead. We're not taking uh, any step backwards, and we're moving very strongly. We also built or put together a, a task force of citizens and interest, people who are interested in helping us build the exchange and, and building this new market for consumers to purchase insurance. And I know that there are tireless advocates out there who are working on insurance, access to affordable care, access to affordable insurance, all of those issues. The court decision, as everybody knows, uh, was issued. It's behind us. But it means a time when you can't deny coverage anymore because of pre-existing conditions. It means a time when youth can have coverage up to age 26. It's a, it's a time when insurance companies will have to compete for their business, and it's a time when we can help improve access to affordable health care. It's a time when we have to start keep fighting and making sure that we have those, uh, those services to, for, for our citizens. Now, as Commissioner of Commerce, one of my responsibilities, as I indicated, is to watch and protect consumers in the insurance marketplace. I will do everything I can, and I have. It was in charge of, the, of uh, Governor Dayton to make sure that the, all insurance companies are held accountable. And when we have stories like today, I'll do everything in my power to help and be at your side to fight for that. My name's Kevin Evenson, and I was recently hired as the, as the director of the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division, Minnesota Department of Human Services. This topic is close to my heart as I am an alcoholic and a drug addict now in recovery for 30 years.
started using alcohol and drugs at an early age and almost immediately started suffering from its effects. My family has a long history of addiction. It was 1981 when I entered a Minnesota State Operated Treatment Program for my addiction. The one thing I remember the most regarding my treatment experience was a multidisciplinary staff available to help me enter recovery. The facility provided a primary care doctor who completed a history and physical, a psychologist who administered psychological testing, and nursing staff who administered medications. I even had meetings with a spiritual advisor to help me find something outside of myself that I could believe in. The facility had certified counselors and a family program to help educate family members and to help with the transition back into society. One of the best things that happened to me was the counselor setting me up with a sponsor upon discharge who took me to my first self-help group meeting in the community. Without that first meeting, I may uh, not have gone. The community support was invaluable in my recovery process, listening to those who had been in my shoes and now are living productive lives and healthy lives. The Minnesota model was residential and was a model which addressed all areas in life. I've been working in the field for the last 25 years as a counselor, counselor supervisor, program director, and now in the policy division here at the Department of Human Services. My goal in my current position is to look for ways to ensure, ensure those who suffer from mental health and addiction disorders get the services that they need. I wish I could tell you that the stigma attached to behavioral health is a thing of the past. Well, during the last 25 years, I have, been, I have seen some improvement, not, much, not as much as I hoped. While science and, um, has identified addiction as a brain disease and can show on scans the areas of the brain being affected, there are still those who would choose to see it as a matter of choice. I believe we need to do a better job of educating the public in hopes of making it easier for people who suffer from addiction and to get services they need. I believe as we move forward with parity and the Affordable Care Act, there will be some issues we'll have to address, issues like access to treatment. Currently, our rules are written so that a person could have to wait up to 30 days from the time they request treatment for addiction until the time they actually receive services. I would like to see this time reduced as we all know time is of the essence when someone is ready to receive help. Another issue we will have to address uh, dealing with access to services is workforce. We, have, uh, we will have to have enough trained professionals to address the demand for service. I would like to see the utilization of telemedicine within the addiction field. Rural Minnesota is difficult to serve and access to care is an issue. I believe telemedicine could be a part of the solution to this issue. We see it working with primary care, psychiatry, and psychology. I believe it will also work for addiction counseling. My overarching goal is to move addiction services in the state of Minnesota to a recovery-oriented system of care, a system where we move from episodes of care to a continuum of care system, which will provide the right treatment at the right time based on clinical decision-making. Integrate, integrating addiction with primary care and mental health will be crucial as we move forward. Thank you. And uh, first on parity and writing the rule and getting it right, my, my request for that rule is that uh, treatment be covered by insurance, whether it's ordered by the court or whether it's, it's sought by the individual seeking treatment. Uh, many, many people who appear in front of me are not in the frame of mind they need to be in to, to make the decision whether or not to pursue treatment. And uh, my the AA people I know in Owatonna have always told me that uh, uh, the percentage of effective treatment doesn't change whether it's court ordered or whether it's voluntarily sought. So I think that's important language. The quest that drives me to, to get on the panel here tonight actually started with a, with a disabled veteran who appeared in front of me back in 2009. And uh, this particular individual appeared in front of me very ill, had lost approximately 85% plus of his hearing uh, service-connected PTSD, chemical dependency issues, first-degree felony DWI, um, violations of terms and conditions of probation after pleading guilty. And uh, he's here tonight. He has graciously and courageously volunteered to let me use his case as my example here tonight. And uh, he's not only been sober for quite some time, he's now working for Teen Challenge, working with uh, chemically dependent youth. I recognize that uh, Mr. Olson needed treatment, and 
he advised me at the hearings that he had treatment scheduled at the Veterans Administration that had already pre-scheduled. So I ordered the Steele County Sheriff, and, I, and mind you, on a first degree DWI, I'm mandated to send him to jail. That's not a choice for a judge to make. We don't have that attitude. So I'm sending Mr. Olson to jail. He tells me he's got appointments at the VA. So I say to the Steele County Sheriff, much to his chagrin, I order you to take Mr. Olson to the hospital in Minneapolis so he can keep those awaited appointments. A uh, friend of mine, Dame Dan Finney, a former captain in the Otana Police Department, took uh, Mr. Olson up to the VA where they were met at the gate and not allowed into the facility because he was incarcerated. Incarcerated vet disabled veterans are not permitted to be cared for by the VA. So I'm requesting a little bit of a change in the statute, and I've submitted the, in my uh, written remarks for the record what, what specific statutes need to be changed. Um, I changed the rule so that incarcerated veterans, be it a county jail or a prison, be allowed the continuity of care to be treated by their physicians, psychiatrists, psychologists uh, at the Veterans Administration, have the Veterans Administration bill the county or the state the responsible governmental entity for the service provided by the VA, but give them that continuity of care, prevent the break in their records, prevent the local governments from having to reinvent the wheel in, in finding an audiologist or a neurologist and then start the testing over again so that these disabled veterans receive that continuity of care that they deserve from the service. How do we as the consumer become the expert? I think one of the, what, the new tools we're going to have is the health care exchange. There's going to be a lot more information about that so people, so consumers can go in and make more informed decisions, those who go on the exchange, when they're choosing their insurance to begin with. So you know, able to know what you're buying, know what your rights are, um, and, and that's going to be, I think, really important. Uh, so I think that's going to be one very good tool on getting people more engaged. We have a website now, it's Health Reform Minnesota, where you can go now and learn about your rights and understand them and fight for the, the things that you, uh, you deserve. Also, with the exchange, we're making it as consumer friendly as possible. And I just want to remind everybody as well that the Department of Commerce has staff. We help people every day with insurance needs and insurance problems. People that help with complaints and help with all our investigation and issues like that. So please, you know, if, if there's issues like that, call us. We have a lot of information available to you and we're happy to help. And can I just add too, if it's a public program and you're having concerns with insurance and coverage, we have ombuds people. You can call them, reach out to them. They're there to help you. Do you have enough in, in terms of resources needed to meet the needs of Minnesotans? Never. <laughs> I think we could always use additional resources. I think uh, right now, I think it's one in ten individuals um, who need services get services. I think there's always room <coughs> for additional resources. What about among your brethren? Are there other are there other judges that hold the same values and perceptions that you have, and in, in knowing that 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 addiction and mental illness are treatable illnesses and that people can get well, or do we need to do a better job of educating the judicial profession? Well, I, I, Calvin Coolidge always said that only persistence and determination are omnipotent. You have to remember that old white-haired judges like me, we roll over every few years in, in our positions on the bench, tend to get appointed later in life, so it, it takes continual uh, persistence and education to the, the judges coming on the bench. Uh, to recognize uh, mental health issues as physical health issues uh, and, and why, I don't know, well I guess historically that dichotomy was established in, but it's time that that died. Approximately 400,000 of the 20 million Americans needing treatment for a substance use disorder reside in Minnesota. Of these, about 14,000 did receive treatment in the Twin Cities last year, but only 30% of them received the current practice standard of care. Of all major chronic diseases, addiction has the largest gap between the need for treatment and access to those treatments. So the timing of this hearing in the month following the Supreme Court's decision on the Affordable Care Act is particularly prescient, for we cannot truly discuss parity without discussing access to care, and access to care is not enough to ensure parity. I hope that my comments here tonight 
will assist in highlighting areas that must be addressed as the rules writing process begins. I will illustrate with an example of Mr. Jones, not his real name, a 26-year-old gentleman who was seen at my hospital, Minnesota's premier safety net hospital, the Hennepin County Medical Center. Mr. Jones overdosed on heroin and required brief ventilation support and monitoring for uh, acute kidney injury uh, due to tissue breakdown while he was on the floor before the ambulance arrived. Fortunately, he made a full recovery from his overdose and related injury before he left the hospital. We discussed his treatment options, the risks and benefits associated with these options, and he decided he would like to try methadone maintenance and he would like to have it at the Hennepin County Medical Center because that's where he'll be establishing his primary care. Unfortunately, I had to tell Mr. Jones that in Minnesota, he is required to go through a complex prior authorization process that is 17 pages in length and is conducted only at select sites. That a bachelor level assessor will determine whether the treatment plan he and I worked on together is one that will be funded and even if they do agree to fund it, they will then determine where that will occur, and it may or may not be at the Hennepin County Medical Center where he'll have his primary care. Unfortunately, too many patients like Mr. Jones are not able to navigate this complex process. What was a reachable moment in the hospital has been disrupted by a burdensome gatekeeper process that is effectively a non-quantitative treatment limit that needs to end in Minnesota and elsewhere. I can think of no other area of medicine that places such barriers on access to care as in addiction medicine. It certainly does not happen for the 20 million Americans with diabetes, and it needs to stop for the 20 million Americans with substance use disorders. But once, once barriers are dismantled, we need to assure that addiction treatment incorporates and is incentivized based on adherence to national quality standards, as is the case with diabetes. The application of these standards and the resultant outcomes should be measured through an integrated health record that includes addiction treatment with provider reimbursement based on adoption of these practices. But parity will be a statutory fiction unless we can assure that there's a qualified workforce to meet treatment needs. And we need to take the example of Massachusetts, which has a head start on parity and universal access to care. Since the two years following universal access in Massachusetts, there has been a 0% increase in access to substance use uh, treatment. So we cannot say that access to care and universal coverage will ensure that people are making it in. So don't expect the floodgates to open just because we have parity in the Affordable Care Act. Those in need will not be able to get the necessary services until health professionals in training are taught to diagnose, treat, and refer patients to addiction specialists. We must then have a plan for workforce development that sets curriculum standards for addiction training and also creates the needed funding for addiction medicine residency programs so more physicians can treat those in need. So in summary, I wish to testify that for Parity and the Affordable Care Act to be successful, the rule writing process must one, put an end to non-quantitative treatment limitations, two, establish and then incentivize adherence to quality standards for addiction treatment, and three, fund workforce development in addiction medicine to improve diagnosis and referral to trained specialists. It is only after these steps are completed that those untreated millions and their families and fellow citizens will be able to enjoy the communities of recovery and the parity that you have all fought so hard for. Thank you. Thank you. I will have to tell you that this is a very, very big challenge for a faculty member and a doctor to have such little time to talk about this. <laughs> Except when limited to 15 minutes to talk to my patients. This is really a terrible part of mental health parity and a major complaint that mothers and fathers have about bringing their sons to see psychiatrists. I'd like to introduce my testimony tonight by saying that there is a significant lack of parity for people in the United States, but this has been going on for a long time. 
I would like you to know that back in the 1950s and 60s, there were a number of lawsuits by people who were committed to state hospitals who were not treated. If you can imagine being in an asylum and not receiving treatment, these very successful lawsuits led to very improved treatment in our state hospital system and allowed a significant number of people to go home. It's also important to note the seriousness of psychiatric illness. A number of people testifying tonight have pointed out how horrible these illnesses are and they even lead to a certain lethality. Most of the focus in the United States on health has been focusing on cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and other serious medical illnesses. And that is really, really good. It has led to a very substantial reduction in mortality and morbidity of these illnesses. However, the World Health Organization is now assessing the severity of psychiatric illnesses by examining the morbidity, not just the mortality, that is one of the ways we look at other medical illnesses. This is the assessment of the impact of the illness on the person's life. It turns out that schizophrenia, depression, and substance abuse all are in the top 10 around the world. These are very serious illnesses, prolonged illnesses, and illnesses that interrupt a person's life. In addition, as Lucinda Jessen pointed out earlier, the severity of severe psychiatric illnesses leads to a decrease in a person's life expectancy by 20 to 25 years. This is because of the lack of fair and appropriate treatment they receive for their mental illness and occasionally the ignoring of the medical illness that a person has when they are in certain mental health care settings. I want to say a few words about the importance of parity. Our health care system, not just the public, our health care system needs to eliminate the stigma, the discrimination, and the ideas of hopelessness that occurs within our health care systems today. We really need to understand and implement parity in our health care systems to lead to better understanding the public of how significant it has been to ignore those with mental illness. Also related to parity is the highly significant lack of support for the treatment of serious psychiatric illness. Many families of seriously ill young people heard a wonderful depiction tonight but we know we need to intervene early, complain to us that they get to see a doctor two to three times a year for 15 minutes. That is just inexcusable in my impression. Related to the issue of parity for the treatment of psychiatric illness are studies by the National Institute of Mental Health. They have found that doctors in America about 60% of the time are actually prescribing an appropriate medication for the person they're treating. Not overwhelming, but they're doing that. About 20 to 30 percent of the people with serious psychiatric illnesses are reading, re receiving uh, science-based psychosocial interventions. Family therapy, family psychosocial support, cognitive behavior therapy, and vocational rehabilitation. Those are interventions that have a huge effect on the seriously mentally ill person and a minority of people are receiving these treatments. I think that uh, at this point I would like to um, come to some close as I think I see I have a minute left and I'd like to note that uh, as a faculty member at the University of Minnesota I need to note that the parity for mental health insurance coverage is a crucial and important step to the outcome of our patients. However, in addition to this issue of parity, it is also extremely important for us to advance our knowledge and to advance our treatment. The treatment, great. If everybody can get it and we have the resources to do it, 
But we can't stand still. We can't just be where we are now. We have to develop new treatments. We have to be able to, by science methods, determine which treatments work. The National Institute of Mental Health needs to step up and develop centers and train specialists so we have outstanding doctors, psychologists, social workers to address these very significant issues. I'm Tricia Stark and I'm a provider but I'm also a family member and I'm a consumer and I know that psychotherapy and psychotropic medications work if you can get them. What I'm hearing from patients and from other providers is that they're, they're seeing parity subverted, as we've all, all heard here. And it's happening through a variety of ways. And it's affecting access, and it's also affecting the networks of providers. One way that we see it happening is through aggressive um, utilization management, um, by prior authorization for entire classes of services. For example, psychological testing with one payer, they're basically refusing all requests and everything must be prior authorized. Similarly, with psychotropic medications, the f you must fail first. And the huge time that providers are spending um, trying to get prior authorization for their patients so they can get the medications they need. They're spending all this money on utilization review and, you know, it makes me suspicious. What are they up to? Okay? Um, <laughs> um, we're seeing some plans have exclusions so that you can be covered for depression but they won't cover your depression medication. And that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, let's see. They're also making changes in the middle of policy years. So um, the employers and the patients don't even have the opportunity to find another payer. Uh, let's see. Rejections are based on medical necessity criteria. And as a provider, I've called these places and said, well, if I have to abide by these standards, could I get a copy? And they say, no, we're sorry, you can't have them. They're proprietary. Well, how will I know what I can give to my patients if I don't know what the rules are? So families and providers are in this just terrible position. But the thing that, that worries me the most is I'm watching a similar pattern march across the country. I hear about Texas and Massachusetts and Georgia and Tennessee and North Carolina and then Minnesota. And it's all the same pattern and it's all the same activities. And my fear is that this is a way of constricting services so that when we get into the exchanges, the essential benefit sets will be so reduced that it's not going to serve the people in the exchanges or the rest of us. And, you know, we can't wait. This has to happen. It's really important. And they're, I think they're trying to silence us through stigma and expecting that we won't speak up. But I think this is evidence that if we speak together, we can make parity um, effective and, and um, bring it to life here. So, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. My grandmother uh, was a chronic schizophrenic, spent her uh, entire adult life in institutionalized, and as part of that, and by the way, 93 years old, is when she died. So, an entire uh, lifetime almost. So, what I can say is, without a doubt, we have made major strides in treatment of mental illness and addiction disorders. Uh, yes, we have a lot of work to do, but believe me, uh, compared to early times in 
this century, we've, we've really made uh, dramatic progress. So parity for mental health and addiction treatment has really been a long journey with uh, certainly many twists and turns. We've come a long way, but we have so much more that we need to do, and we all know that. Uh, Minnesota has clearly been, however, a leader uh, in terms of ad, uh, uh, advocacy uh, from the political realm and service delivery. Uh, and, you know, thanks to everyone here for certainly the passage of the Wellstone Dominici uh, Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. Uh, it's truly been a milestone. And we clearly need that final rule, but uh, certainly what I can say is from a health plan perspective that, uh, you know, from recovery and, and service delivery, um, you know, complying with that act has been, that part, at least been the, the easy part uh, with, with that, that whole issue of the, of the coverage piece. So what has been much more difficult has been, you know, the, the details. Um, and certainly we have interim rules and, and uh, anything that comes from Washington uh, with rules, whether they be interim or final, uh, believe me, uh, the complexity is, is tremendous and it's always a difficult thing to uh, implement. Um, but what I can say is that uh, without a doubt in my mind, it has led to better care for people with mental health and substance abuse uh, and, and also on the medical side. So as a parity act, it, uh, it, it, from a health plan perspective, you have to examine all of what you're doing. And I, I really do believe that it has led to, to better coverage, better coverage or, and better care on, on the medical side. So the next chapter uh, in healthcare reform is uh, implementation of the Affordable Care Act. And um, again, this will provide substantially better coverage overall, uh, covering millions of more people than have been covered. And so that is a major stride uh, and will make a difference. And obviously we have to make sure that, uh, you know, from a parity perspective that, um, you know, we, we cover equally. So we've also made uh, major progress in our system reforms here in Minnesota, and, um, and particularly from the standpoint of integrating that medical care and mental health care uh, that we need to continue to work on. We need to certainly uh, reduce fragmentation of care, lack of coordination, and people falling through the cracks. We know that still happens. And, uh, you know, not to mention the work to reduce the stigma as uh, so many of the speakers have uh, articulated. So Minnesota is better than most states, but that's not good enough. We need to continue on our journey. The key will be to continue to talk with one another, and I think that's really important. So, you know, nothing to take away from a final rule that's important in terms of accountability, but when it really gets down to it here in Minnesota, we have a history of collaboration history of providers, health plans, uh, consumers, advocates, uh, people, politicians, sitting down and talking and coming up with the right way to do things and improve uh, what we're doing. So in my estimation, that continues to be the real key, is that kind of conversation that we need to have. Uh, and then continue to work together to improve the care system. Um, so again, we have that tradition here in Minnesota. I think we have the leadership. Uh, we need to get it done. Thank you. Would it be all right for us to have an audit every year of all the insurance plans here in Minnesota on whether they are complying with this rule and making the results public of all the denials of care for the various illnesses we've heard testify to tonight. But what, what we have said, uh, you know, is through the Council of Health Plans, uh, and uh, as you may know if you read the papers, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about uh, audits and uh, passage of legislation around auditing from a financial perspective. 
And I think the health plans have uh, been on record to say that we've always been in favor of those kinds of audits on the finance side. And absolutely, we're in, uh, always in favor of those kinds of audits uh, from a rulemaking and a statutory side. And so, a matter of fact, uh, again, we actually do have every year, <laughs> we have CMS, the state, we have auditors in, and we, you know, the question is, what, what are the right things to audit, right? And right. so that's, that's what we need to get to, is what are the right things to audit? Well, thanks again. I'm reminded uh, by what my father used to say a lot uh, with respect to this issue, and this was the issue that he, this was his issue. I mean, he had a lot of issues, but this was uh, the most important um, thing to him was, this is a besieged minority, is what he would always say. And I think it comes, goes to the stigma piece. Um, we need to all stand up fight and work together. As you kind of heard, there's tricks, there's sort of little things that are used to, to deny care. I mean, we all know that, you could, whether it's NQTL or whether it's, yeah. but what we need to do is stand up together and fight. We've got the Parity Now Implementation Coalition and others. I'm anxious to, to, to continue the fight with you, Patrick and Jim as well, so look forward to working with you. I hope that what you take from tonight is to become active in petitioning on behalf of people who are denied care. And if we're, we're successful in the rule, you will have a way of judging whether health plans are complying on the long list of matrix of ways that they determine care through prior authorization, inpatient, outpatient, whether the disease is covered or whether it isn't, whether the treatment for the disease is covered or whether it isn't. There are many ways that you can go at this. We need to map it out and then allow you, the consumer, to be empowered to make the appeals. But we need an appeals process that's expedited and we need an appeals process that's transparent, which means that you cannot bury people in paperwork and then settle with them. We need to know what's happening here in Minnesota is also happening in Rhode Island. It's happening in Florida, as it was just said. We're all in this together. And so if we can do this here, we can do this around the country, we'll, we'll be part of something really important in terms of making the, the future what we want it to be. I think President Kennedy said it best when he said, here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. I want to thank each and every one of you for doing God's work in Minnesota so exceedingly well. Thank you.